Welcome to Health Focus. I'm your host, Dr. Scott, and I'm welcoming you to 2019 as we begin to focus on health and fitness. You know, after the holidays, many of us get a little bit out of shape if we weren't out of shape to begin with. And if it's any consolation, you're not alone because studies indicate that two-thirds of Americans are overweight and up to one-third are actually obese. And it's a constant struggle to try to achieve that healthy lifestyle that we're all trying to really get into. And we're really fortunate today to have a fantastic guest, Steve Bennell. Welcome to Health Focus. Thank you. Thank you. And I understand that you are actually a uh, group fitness instructor and a sort of life coach who helps people to become more healthy and fit. And, uh, you know, in the beginning of the new year, that's when it really becomes important for many of us. I don't know that New Year's resolutions really work, but tell us about what you do and how you got into this field. Uh, yeah, well, um, I was a very active uh, child, um, played, played sports, um, ran about, you know, playing childhood games. Um, you know, I came from a generation where, you know, parents let their kids run run free and you know didn't didn't want to see you back home until you know dinner time and um, I, I took full advantage of that I was a very very active kid about five years ago uh, I, I was um, I started coaching running groups at Flea Feet um, and uh, you know it really enjoyed the the um, the collaboration I had with, with, with other coaches and with participants. And um, I, I, you know, I was so, so uh, interested in it. Um, I continued to coach. Um, that transitioned to, to um, other, other um, coaching um, opportunities. And um, yeah, here, here I am today. That's fantastic. And do you focus mainly on diet or exercise or a little bit of both? Most, mostly exercise, although I would argue that um, you know, our fitness routine is, is inherently linked to our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, I, 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 I express uh, whenever I take on a new client that you know, it's, it's important you know, not not just not just the exercise component, but but you know what what are we doing the rest of the day, um, and 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 that could be you know any anything from our eating um, habits to to um, ha you know our, our sedentary habits as well. Right. In other words, we're talking about a lifestyle, not just a brief interaction like a diet or a sudden exercise program. We're talking about a person's life and a lifestyle. Exactly, exactly. And you work a lot with older people, right? I do, I do. Um, I would say the majority of my hours spent, um, you know, in my field is is uh, working working with older adults. Now, of course, we say older people, and for some people that could have kind of a pejorative connotation because all of us are getting older and there can be some discrimination against the elderly that we have to guard against. Sure. But what when you say old, or when I say old or elderly, uh, in your case, what do you think of? What is there an age, a cutoff, or is it based on how you feel? Yeah, well, I think it's how you know it's it's how we perceive it, and and um, um, and I'll give you an example. Um, I have a, a woman in one of my my uh, group fitness classes. She's she's ninety one years old, mm -hmm. um, and she is just in, incredible. I mean, she I, I use her you know to demonstrate what a what a, a functional squat looks like, what, what a functional hinge looks like, mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, and, and she's taking care of her body throughout the years, so, um, and that, you know, and it's, it's no wonder that she's, you know, vibrant at, at age 91. I mean. And you're involved in some programs that are directed specifically towards more mature people, are you not? Yes, yes. Can so, you tell us about some of those programs? Yeah, so, so I teach... Um, I teach classes and do personal training at University Retirement Center. Um, I also, um, my most popular class is at a health club um, that also deals with uh, the older population. Um, What's the name it, of the club? Uh, it's Davis One Fitness. Okay. Yep. Um, and I just started this year teaching um, a very similar class uh, through the city of Woodland. Um, and I'll be teaching another similar class uh, in Davis 
starting next week. So, uh, where do you teach in Woodland? Uh, at at the city of Woodland, uh, the community center and, and senior center. Okay. Uh, do you have a website or a way that people could get in touch with you? If they uh, want to? Not right now. Um, I'm right now putting together a, a in the process of putting together a website. I um, there's an app that people can download. It's called MindBody, and it's it's okay. how I s schedule my my um, my appointments. Um, people okay. can go on there and, and look at the calendar of my classes. And now, let's say somebody doesn't want to join a gym. Can a person still stay physically fit? An older person uh, without joining a gym? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it, I have that impression too, but. It, I wanted to see if you also agreed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it, it really it really ties into um, you know my my specialty in, in functional fitness. That um, you know, as, as as long as we're taking care of our bodies um, throughout our day, uh, you know, there, there's there's no reason why we need to go in and fit in that half hour hour of exercise that, that um, most people seem to be doing. Yeah, and I, most people, to be honest, not enjoying. Right. <laughs> I think a lot of things that are just part of everyday life, like walking a dog or taking a long walk, are exercise and should be viewed as such. It doesn't necessarily have to be a formal activity. Absolutely. I, I think there, there needs to be an intrinsic you know, joy to, to moving our bodies. And I think that's, that's what keeps us, keeps us going. Um, could you share maybe just a single success story of you know how somebody's life might have been improved by exercising and working with you? Just a, or a generic kind of example. It doesn't have to be a specific. Yeah, question. just I mean, just off the top of my head, um, a woman came up to me um, the other day, right after my class, and she says, you know, I just want to tell you, um, I was able to put on my underwear for the first time in a long time, standing up without having to sit down. That's fantastic. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think we're going to put you to work and actually see a few of these exercises demonstrated. But before we do that, I'd just like to ask in general terms, uh, uh, what kind of equipment does a person need in terms of clothing or shoes who's not really very athletic but wants to begin to get more fit? Yeah, I mean, as far as clothing, I, it, as long as you know, you're, you're comfortable in, in the clothing, um, I, I would... Try to stay away from, uh, you know, 100% cotton material. Um, um, that doesn't absorb, you know, you know, especially if you're if you're doing a vigorous exercise, it doesn't a, a, absorb the sweat. And um, but but um, I would also say, uh, you know, in, gar in regards to shoes, that um, you know, I'm a I'm a big fan of a, a, a sort of a minimal heel drop of a shoe, not not too much of a heel, something that's you know, closer closer to the ground um, gives us more connection to the ground, and I and I would you know strongly encourage that. Um, not not just for for everyone, but especially for for older folks. And I guess it's also important to at least consider seeing your doctor, particularly if you're over age forty or fifty. I would say, and to perhaps be checked out to make sure you don't have any heart condition or other condition that might really render exercise potentially dangerous. I also think a warm-up period before you start exercising is important so your heart doesn't suddenly get stressed too much in a cool-off period afterwards. Do you agree? Absolutely. I, I mean, especially with my, my older demographic, um, we go through a lengthy warm-up routine where we're, we're mobilizing all the joints, um, we're getting the heart rate up, um, we're, uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're you know, we're getting a sweat going on before before we get into the strength training and the resistance right. training. Well, of course, a picture is worth a thousand words, and we have more than one picture when we shoot an image of somebody doing something. Right. And what I'd like to ask you to do is actually demonstrate some exercises with some of our studio staff and volunteers, and one of whom happens to be my wife, and another one is a good friend of mine. And um, really, I'd like you to focus on how these exercises can be helpful to people in everyday life. Uh, these are not older people, but particularly older people. Would you be willing to, to do that for us, Steve? Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, okay, yeah. why don't we go do it now? Absolutely. All, all right. right, let's go. All right. Steve, I really feel like I've got a sense of what this is all about, but I wonder if you could show me with one of our health-focused volunteers, Blake. Blake is an athlete. He's a pre-med student at UC Davis. Uh, maybe you could start with a hinge. Absolutely, absolutely. So a hip hinge is simply 
just moving our hips from a, a neutral position to a flex position by sending our hips back, right? And so the reason why this is important for functional movement is that we want to um, express that, that hinge first. We want to load the hips up first before we load the knees. Most people, when they go to sit down or squat for whatever reason, it's always, it seems like it's always knees first. Um, so we want to we want to protect the knees by loading the hips and then flexing at the knees. And why is this beneficial? Well, it's I mean in, in real life, it's how we should be picking up objects off the floor, heavy objects. Um, so, Blake, why don't you demonstrate <clears throat> how you would pick up a heavy object off the floor? So Blake is demonstrating a, a, a traditional deadlift, um, and he's expressing the hip hinge right. He's, he's, he's got a neutral spine. Mm -hmm. And when he stands up, he's going to extend through the knees and through the hips and lift up the imaginary barbell. So mm -hmm. if you were lifting up a heavy object, like a rock, for instance, you would do the same movement. So why don't you show us? Imagine, yes. So he's got the hinge going on. He's got the rock in his arms. And he uses that, that hinge and that expression to, to stand straight up. So Steve, we're taking the biomechanics of a deadlift performed by somebody who's in great physical condition. And we're applying that to what all of us could do in our daily lives, particularly as we get to be more mature, perhaps a bit older. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and saving the wear and tear on our joints. Um, that's that's the, the main idea here is, um, you know, our, our largest muscles are in our hips and right. our glutes. So if we load those up first before we load the knees, uh, our knees will thank us. Okay, and I understand you have another exercise to demonstrate with Blake. Yeah, so we can we can transition that into a squat. Um, uh, and so a functional squat, um, shall I demonstrate that first? Yeah, sure. So a functional squat, I teach it, the, uh, the feet are just outside the hips. Again, I'm gonna express the hinge, but not as much as if I was doing a deadlift. Um, I would just express it slightly and then I would flex through the knees and the hips and then come up through the, the back of my heels. Okay, and how does that help us in our day-to-day -day lives? Um, let's bring the chair out. And okay. We'll, 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 we'll show you. All right. <laughs> um, so if Blake was going to have a seat, whatever chair he's sitting at, <laughs> he, he would be demonstrating a, a functional air squat. Um, is this practical? No, but if we can practice thinking about moving our hips back first before loading our knees, then again, we can think about the wear and tear on our joints and, and how, how this applies to um, you know, daily life. Okay, so Blake's a great athlete. I'm just a regular guy. I'm coming up to this chair. Yes. I'm going to sit down, and you tell me if I'm doing it right. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. this is how I ordinarily would do it. I would just come up and sit down. I assume that's probably not the best way. Okay, yeah. I mean, you did it rather quickly. Um, but, yeah, as, as most people do, they, they load the knees up first, and then they sit down. Now, now, now tell me the better way to do it. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm at yes. work. I'm working on my computer or whatever, and I want to sit down. Yeah, so... You would initiate the movement with your hips. Okay. So you just loaded your knees. That's good. No. That's bad. That's bad. Okay. You want to load your hips. All right. There you go. There's a little bit of a hinge. All right. Now settle your hips down. Oh, yeah. Yes. So the idea is to have your knees stacked over your heels. Okay. Right? So yeah. how are you going to get up from there? If, if, if you practice... I lean forward. Yes. You, you displace your center of mass forward. You've got your knees stacked over your your ankles, right. less stress on the knees. And what would be an example of really doing that in a poor manner that might be harmful to the health of a person, say a middle-aged person who's working in an office, 
How would it be really done poorly? Would it be collapsing too quickly? Not yeah, I could I can demonstrate. I Please. mean, I'll, I'll exaggerate the, yeah. the whole movement. So yeah, mo most people they don't have the awareness. Um, they'll back their, especially older people, they'll back their legs up to their chair, their sitting um, place, and then they load the knees. They might have to look for some support, and then generally they're they're they they found the the seat of the chair. And we, we slowly settle back into a place that's comfortable for us. Unfortunately, um, that place of comfort kind of wrecks havoc on our body as well. We lose the integrity of our spine when we sit back into our comfy chairs and, and start our, you know, mm -hmm. our, our upper, upper back start to round. Um, and, uh, and so in order to have a little bit more of awareness of that, um, you know, we could sit a little bit more upright in our chair, more in our sit bones, maybe have a little bit of um, lumbar support behind us mm -hmm. so we don't, we don't um, ad you know, adapt to that, that shape. So this is really applying these principles in a functional way in our day-to-day -day lives. Absolutely. You know, that was really fantastic, Steve, and I'd like to move on. I think the next exercise is the lunge or the split lunge. And uh, come on up, Camille. I'd like to invite a num another member of our volunteer community here. Happens to be my wife, Camille, who actually is in good shape. She's a power lifter. But perhaps to kind of continue this theme of applying these exercise principles to all of us, maybe you could demonstrate the issues of the lunge and how to do it properly with Camille. Yeah, yeah. So Camille, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate um, a lunge uh, in, a, in a functional manner. And um, a lunge is helpful for getting us down and up off the floor. So I'll go ahead and demonstrate it first. So I'm going to get myself in a split stance. Um, I'm going to flex both my knees at the same time as I settle myself easily and carefully down to the floor. I'm going to bring that front lunge leg back behind me. And if I have to come all the way down to the floor, um, if we're a grandparent and we want to come down to the floor to play with our, our grandkids, this would be um, the easiest and safest way, I think, to get down the floor. The way we, we come up off the floor is uh, very similar. So we come up to a tall kneeling position. We're going to bring out our dominant leg, right? Now, we could either have support from a chair or a piece of furniture. But if you have the strength to use that dominant leg to press off and come up to your standing position, um, I think that's the safest way to get down and up off the floor. So go ahead, Camille. So show us. Very good. Excellent. She made that look easy. So, yeah. Okay. So let's say that I'm playing with my kids. Okay. So I'm not a great athlete or a power lifter. I'm just some guy. And I'm saying, hey, I want to play too. Here, I'm going to go down like this. Wow, let's play Monopoly. Was my movement not, an error in some no, respect? No, not, not bad. Not bad. How um, can I apply these principles? Yeah. So, um, so show me how you would get up. I'd get up like this. Okay. Yeah. The, um, those, the, the, that was pretty good movement, getting down and up off the floor. Okay. Um, I, I would suggest a little bit more of a, um, a, a longer stride. And okay. A more, but that gives you a little bit more stable, a stable um, uh, balance. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we just s easily go down to the floor. Yeah. Now, if you, if, if you want to come straight up from that, you just extend through the knees and the hips and okay. you come back up. That's great because I only play Monopoly when I'm wearing a suit and tie. It's a rule <laughs> in our home. You know. And you have another exercise for us, right? Uh, yeah. So, um, so let's transition from there to a, a lunge, right? Getting down with that, that same, same lunge. And if I had to come all the way to the floor, I would 
settle my, my torso slowly and carefully, right? And then if I had to push myself up off the floor, I would press up, come up to a tall kneeling position, and back to my, my half kneeling position and then standing up. Uh, yes, go ahead, Camille. So there, so there are a few things I, I forgot to mention here, and and um, so go back, go back to your your press up. One of the things I cue when I'm when I'm teaching a push up or a press up is to screw our hands into the floor. That puts our shape, uh, our shoulder in a much more stable position, and you're going to notice your your elbows come closer to your sides. It's going to recruit the larger muscles in your back. And then when you press off from the floor, notice that her, her elbows are a little bit tracking closer to her body as opposed mm -hmm. to out here, which is a little harder, harder on the shoulder joint. Okay. So, And consistent with the theme of you know, how this helps people in the community, let's say that somebody knows how to do this. What kind of activities would that be helpful for? Is that for house cleaning or dressing or gardening? or? Yeah, I mean, all of those. All of those, um, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're we're not a culture that sleeps on the floor, right? Um, so, um, but getting yourself up and out of your your bed, you know, right? That's you know, that's it's applicable to that as well. Um, okay, great. You know, I'd like to uh, thank our volunteers. Thank you, dear. And uh, let's talk a little bit more about the lessons that this brings to us as we try to apply this functional training in everyday life. So let's yeah. go back to the interview room. Okay. okay, sounds good. Steve, that was fantastic. But I have to tell you, I never really got an answer to my original question. What is it to be old? What, what is the cutoff for being elderly? Um, wow. <laughs> Again, it's, 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 it's how, we, how we perceive that. Um, um, I mean, you, you would you would be you would I mean in your field you you could give me a better just okay I'll take a shot at it because I'm I'm at looking at it from the medical angle as a geriatrician right and um, I think that most physicians would say that it varies tremendously from person to person but middle age is roughly age forty to sixty okay after age sixty we're considered to be seniors or elderly however extreme old age is usually defined as after age eighty five. And at that point, you start to have more chronic illnesses. The um, centenarians are those who live to be over 100 years old. Right. And the super centenarians are usually over, older than 110. In fact, uh, we just lost the oldest World War II veteran, Richard Overton, who I believe was 112. Uh -huh. And when you get to that extreme of age, there seems to be a strong genetic component to longevity. So Mr. Overton, for example, uh, smoked cigars and drank whiskey and had other habits that might not have been considered healthful by right, some, and yet right. he managed to get to 112. So to, the answer from my perspective as a geriatrician is that it's highly variable. But probably you enter the threshold of old age at, at about age 60. But having said that, as the baby boomers get older, uh, it seems that a lot of these old definitions are becoming antiquated because we see such dynamic, successful people into their 70s and 80s. So I, I've never really been comfortable with these arbitrary numerical definitions. It sounds like you sort of see it that way, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, because, I, I mean, really, I mean, if <clears throat> it, it, to me, it's really how we, we, we take care of ourselves throughout our lifespan. I mean, right. um, you know, if, if a child is, um, is, is overweight and um, inactive, sedentary, the likelihood of him becoming obese as an adult you know, absolutely goes up, and and the same with an uh, an adult. If it, an adult is sedentary um, and overweight, you know, the likelihood of him experiencing you know chronic illness and and, and disease is you know go, goes way up. So, um, yeah, okay. it it really it's really based on how we take care of ourselves. I think. I mean, genetics do play a part, right? Um, but I believe in the you know the 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 um, you know the the nurture. 
uh, nature nurture n nature yeah. nurture aspect of things. Well, anyway, we're focusing on health and exercise, and that's the major interest today. And and you've shown us how you can use your motions on a day to day basis to really maintain your health. But in terms of a more, you know, dedicated effort to be fit. How do you motivate people to start? What if somebody really is having a hard time getting going? I often say start low, go slow. I, I preach that all the time. Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's small steps, it's, it's baby steps. Um, it's, um, you know, n not, not trying to, um, you know, not, not trying to do too much at once. Um, and, and um, you know, also I, I would preface that with um, trying to find um, uh, an, an activity, a movement that you enjoy doing, um, you know, whether that's a sport, a, 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 a dance, um, it could be a simple, you know, walk, you know, with a friend. Um, you know, we're, we're sort of we're sort of stuck in with the idea that you know we have to fit in our our hours worth of exercise, and then we're you know we're done done with it. it um, and that just doesn't appeal to a lot of people. Um, Do you have any closing advice with respect to fitness or diet that would be kind of a take home message? Move more, sit less, um, preferably outdoors um, when, when, it, when you get your, your movement in. And try to eat healthy and... Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Try, to, try, to, try to incorporate a, a healthy diet. I think a positive attitude and getting a lot of rest, having a social network, people who you care about that you interact with. I think that's important too. Would Absolutely, you agree? I totally agree with that. I mean, right. I mean that's that's one of the motivating factors I think that keeps people coming to my class. You know, they right. they, they see you know uh, familiar faces, they make friendships. Um, they're um, yeah, that social connection, you know, is is very important. Well, Steve Bunnell, it's really been a pleasure having you here on Health Focus. I think that uh, we've only scratched the surface of health and fitness, but as we get into 2019, it seems like a good time of year to be addressing that. And I hope we'll be able to continue this conversation in the future, and I wish you the best in your teaching activities and your work with the community. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Come back and see us again. I will. I will. Remember, on Health Focus, we focus on your health. This is Dr. Scott saying thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate our guests, Steve Bunnell, and also our volunteers, uh, Camille and Blake, for being here with us. And we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. In the meantime, stay healthy.